But still, Parangaladev, despite being his guru then, and he being Parangaladev's disciple, still he would cleanse him, bathe him, and look after him in all ways. He would do so in such wonderful ways that all the other Guru Sevaks, they felt very ashamed, thinking that our Guru Maharaj is serving our account brother. And, uh, and we are just standing and looking. And immediately, but Parangadev had so much mouth for his disciple that he would not let anyone else touch him. So that is the love that binds one in this world. That selfless love. In this world, everyone is looking for that selfless love. Because any love that you see in this world is normally tinged with selfishness. Any love. But that selfless love, everyone is drawn to that kind of love. Now, why do so many devotees come to the Vaishnavas? Why do they stay with them? Why do they stay in the same place where they stay? No. Why? Because of that selfless love. They don't expect anything in return from you. Do they expect anything in return? Nothing. All they want is only your welfare, your well being. So being drawn by that selfless love, everyone, the whole world is attracted. So then Srila Gurudev himself, he requested his Guru Maharaj, saying, Maharaj, Gurudev, please, you have many other services to do. You have so much preaching to do in other places. So then Gurudev himself took that responsibility of looking after his God brother. No. This is a very, this responsibility is very deep, very grave. If any devotee is sick, and uh, if he is neglected, he is not looked after, then, then the Guru will not be pleased. Guru they will say that if any devotee is very sick and you look after him, then you get so much mercy from our Guru Varga. Because that devotee, he has been brought to the movement by who? By the Guru Varga themselves. And if he is neglected, he is not looked after, then how will we ever get that mercy? So then Guru Dev himself, by his own life, by his own example, he is shown. Then he went to that place in Madras, in South India, to the tuberculosis hospital, and he looked after him on the Mount Blue. And always, like, cleaning him, bathing him. And Guru said, I also felt sick when I got tuberculosis. It was a highly contagious disease. So if you, if anyone who stays near that person, especially during that time, without any proper treatment, he also get that disease. Then Guru somehow he stayed there, he looked after him, and always. And then, this boy, Arun Mohan, he was such a dear Sevak of Param Gurudev, and even when he was leaving his body, he was remembering Shri Param Gurudev. And he was saying, Oh, Baba is calling me, Baba is calling me. Oh, Radharani is calling me, Krishna is calling me. And then saying like this, he left his body. And Gurudev, he fell at his feet, and he said, Now that you're going to Radha and Krishna, please pray on my behalf as well. So just see, the Seva that he rendered throughout his entire life, the fruit of that seva was reflected at the time of his death. He was dying, those were the last words he had spoken. That Baba is calling me, Radharani is calling me, Krishna is calling me, Mahabhu is calling me. Then he left his body to this way. So therefore we see that such ideal Guru Sevaks, they are very rare in this world. And only if one can be an ideal Guru Sevak, only then can one hope to advance in this line of Krishna Bhakti. Or else how can he possibly hope to advance? No. We are all drawn to Gurudev's movement by the ideal Guru Sevak. As for myself, I would have never joined the temple if it wasn't for the ideal Guru Sevak. I wouldn't be staying here now for like some years now. I wouldn't be staying in a dham. So this Guru Sevak has given the chance for all of us to come here, stay in the dham, stay in one place, be with them. And at once, in part of Krishna Mukti, he has given the chance. How much, so how, how grateful we must be to them. If they are given this chance, most priceless opportunity. I could have never imagine that I'd be staying in the town here amongst all the devotees. But still this chance was given. Why? Because the ideal Guru said what he desires. That the entire world be bought at the Lord's feet of Sri Guru. When we speak of Sri Guru, we don't speak of one particular personality. This very term Sri Guru means an all-encompassing reality. Where the entire Guru Tattva converges. Not just that oh. You speak of your Guru, I speak of my Guru. No. Guru Tattva in itself means Akhanda Guru Tattva. Baladev Prabhu, Nityananda Prabhu. And our Guru Varga, they are his representatives in this way. And always ask Gurudev this question. And will we see you in the same form next life or life after life? Gurudev said, the form may change, but the personality is the same. He said. 
ఈ ఎక్స్టర్నల్ అపియరెన్స్ మెచ్చి అది పర్సనాలిటీ హూ హెల్ప్స్ ఇన్ ఆల్ వేస్ ఈజ్ ద సేమ్ బికాస్ శ్రీ గురు ఈ మ్యానిఫెస్ట్ ఇన్ విచ్ ఫార్మ్ యాజ్ దీక్ష గురు శిక్ష గురు చైత్య గురు భజన్ శిక్ష గురు వర్క ప్రదర్శక గురు ఆల్ ఈజ్ వెరీ ఈ మ్యానిఫెస్ట్ ఇన్ సెల్ఫ్ సో దిస్ వే ది ఐడియల్ గురు సేవ్ హీ టీచెస్ వాట్ హీ టీచెస్ అస్ వాట్ గురు తత్వ ఇస్ వాట్ గురు సేవ్ ఇస్ and this way guru dev fell at the feet of anand mohan prabhu he fell at his feet and he prayed to saying kindly pray for me as well to god and krishna and then when param guru dev was speaking in a huge assembly where thousands of people were there and at that time there was no loud speaker there was no sound system like how we have now and param guru dev would be speaking in our any loud speaker thousands of people would come there and when he received this telegram from guru dev saying that Guru Dev said, you gave me one jewel to keep, but I've lost the jewel. And when Param Guru Dev received this telegram, he was weeping so much. Yeah. Even during Shila Vaman Goswami Maharaj's life, Vaman Maharaj, he had one sevak called Sundarananda Prabhu. So Sundarananda Prabhu, he was illiterate. He didn't know how to read or write. Once Guru Dev, he sent him on, once Vaman Goswami Maharaj was so sick. And Sundarananda Prabhu, he had to write a letter to Shila Guru Dev in Mathura. saying my guru maharaj is very sick so kindly come here immediately to jagannath puri but he didn't know how to read and write then he had someone else read write the letter to shri guru dev and as soon as guru dev received this letter and it was mathura then immediately he left everything aside and then he caught a train without any ticket without any reservation he came to jagannath puri and then took shri ram to say maharaj to doctor so this sundarananda prabhu once shri ram to say maharaj he was preaching he was speaking hari kadan mandala in some village so the the electricity went off the electricity got cut so then sundaran and the prabhu he went he tried starting the generator but then he got electrocuted and he left his body he died because there was like a power surge he touched the live wire and he passed away at that time vamun was saying maharaj himself was weeping so much in separation from his disciple so one must not be mistaken one must not think that this separation is like the separation that a father feels for his son or a brother feels for his brother no because when he is weeping in separation from his disciple for which reason like we say when parvati devi and sati ji left her body then shita ko took her body and he was also lamenting in separation why because she was a vaishnavi she gave him that opportunity to speak hari katha to engage in hari kirtan similarly when a guru is so much uh, when a disciple is so much loved by his guru for which reason because that disciple he reminds him so much of the service that he has come to render in this world and what is that service kirtan ye sada hari to always perform kirtan at all times continuously without any stoppage so therefore in separation from this disciple sundar and the prabhu bound to say was weeping so much and then he even wrote he even wrote a letter to shila gurudev and gurudev was in mathura and he wrote a letter to say that oh now that this disciple has left i feel so angry he said and then he requested shri guru dev that if sundarananda has ever committed any offense and he wrote to speak and kindly forgive him and he wrote letters to all his god brothers saying we pray for this boy because when he left his body he was very young maybe only 25 26 years of age so he prayed for this boy so you can imagine when once guru himself is praying on behalf of his disciple to all the vaishnavas in the sangha then you can imagine how fortunate that disciple is imagine what his next destination will be how auspicious his destination will be so in this way narottam thakur is teaching us by his own life how to be an ideal guru sevak and like we heard yesterday in katha that even mothers they clean their children and even if you go to other places in hospitals these people who are very sick they are also looked after by nurses they are also, they are also looked after by other people but does that mean they all get prema bhakti so prema bhakti is rendered with that mood there's the chest up the action and then the bhav the bhav is the underlying intention in any service you perform there's the chest up and there's also the bhav like you may do any service but if there's no bhav then it's a little trying if there's any underlying sentiment underlying mood that i'm doing this seva to please hari guru vaishnavas and all the devotees then the seva bear fruit or so it can possibly bear fruit so in this way day after will be Param Guru Dev's appearance day and then day after that will be Prabhupada Sasi Thakur's appearance day 
So therefore, if we can, if we try to estimate the glories on our own, then we will fail. We will not be able to do so. But if we follow in the footsteps of those who render that kind of seva, who have lived that example, and who teach by that example, who conduct themselves by that example, who instruct everyone by that example, then the observances of these festivals will be very successful. No. Like you see, every day you see, how are we so engaged in bhakti, in the temple? No, beginning from Mangalarti all the way to Katha Kirtan, all the way to Shayanarti. How are we so engaged? Because they themselves are engaged. Hmm? Our Guru Varga themselves are engaged and engaging all the others. You see, one symptom of bhav is Shanti Rabhyakta Kalatpo. Shanti Rabhyakta Kalatpo means the devotee who is in the stage of bhav, he is very careful not to lose even one moment of his time. Even one moment. What to speak of one moment? Fraction of a moment. Fraction of a moment means like a fraction of a second. Even a fraction of a second he is not ready to lose. Because if he loses that even a fraction of a second uselessly, without any uh, due concern for his spiritual advancement, then he is put in so much pain. So therefore the devotees in the stage of bhav, he makes sure that all those who are around him, they are also completely engaged in the seva, in the sadha, in the skirtan. Therefore, all of us we see, we are all engaged here in Katha Kirtan. Why? Because that devotee, he is, in, he is himself in the stage of power. He is a received power question. And therefore, under his guidance, we are also engaged in Katha and Kirtan. So, therefore, this opportunity has been given to us to be in the association of such a Rasik, Vaishnav, Tapta Kirtan. So, we should not lose this opportunity. As much as we can, we should try to make the best use of it and try to advance in this path of Bhakti. So, since Prabhuji was speaking on this book, Prabhupada Padesh Amrit, there's this nice article that was like published in the Rays of the Harvest, which was actually an excerpt of Prabhupada Padesh Amrit. So, Prabhupada Padesh Amrit means the nectarian instructions of Prabhupada, that were like the essence of Prabhupada's teachings. So, I was just reading this article in the Harvest. There, Prabhupada, he has said, it is essential that a genuine commentary on the 10th canto of the Bhagavatam be written. So here Prabhupada is saying that I spent so much of my life speaking on the jungles of Mayavad, impersonalism, Buddhism, Rastikya, all these different philosophies which are against Bhakti. But he said I have spent so much time that I have not laid focus on the very essence of Bhakti. And what is that? The law of the Vajvasis. And without explaining the love of the Vajvasis, how can my preaching ever be like, considered as successful as I want it to be, he said. So here he's saying himself, it is essential that a genuine commentary on the 10th canto of the Bhagavatam be written, he said. So here he's saying that someone must come forward and write this commentary on the 10th canto. What is the 10th canto? It is said the Bhagavatam is like a 12 story building. The Bhagavatam has 12 cantos. So the Bhagavatam is like into a building which has 12 floors. And the 10th floor, there are 90 rooms, because the 10th canto has 90 chapters. So the 10th floor of that 12-story building has 90 rooms. And in the 90 rooms, there are 5 kunjas. So what are those 5 kunjas? Ras Panchadai, Gopi Geet, Brahmar Geet, Jugal Geet, Pranay Geet, Venu Geet. These words of the gopis that are sung in separation from Krishna and on meeting with him, and on singing and dancing with him, these 5 chapters, that are the 5 kunjas of that 12-story building. So Prabhupada is saying, I desire that someone write a commentary on these five chapters of the Bhagavatam. And we see here, when Gurudev published Rasa he fulfilled this desire, Shri Prabhupada. When he published this book in 2008, this commentary has a comment, this book has a commentary of Shri Sridhar Swami, Shri Vishwa Chakrati Thakur, and Shri Jeeva Goswami, and also the Bhavanavad of Shri Gurudev. So here you see, again, an ideal Guru Seva. Guru Seva means what? Is fulfilling the innermost heart's desire of his Guru. Sri Chaitanya Manokrishnam, Stapitam Mena Bhutale. Who is Rupa Goswami? He appeared in this world Bhuta and he established the innermost heart's desire of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And what was that desire of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? That Anapita Charit Chira Karana Tina Karana. Samar Kaitam Unna Tachala Rasam Sabakti Shriya. That this Sabakti Shriya, this Unna Tachala Rasam be established in this world. That was the innermost heart's desire of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Because Mahaprabhu was so much absorbed in the mood of Srimati Radhika that 
He had no time to even write books. How can he even write? And he's only absorbed in the mood of Srimati Radhika. Once Radharani, she wanted to write a letter to Krishna when he was in Mathura. And just when, he, when she wrote that one letter, Ka, she started weeping so much. And she could not even write Krishna. All she could write was just Ka. And weeping, weeping, she fell unconscious on the ground. How could she write the entire letter herself? And she could not even write the name Krishna on the letter in separation from him. Then Lalita, what did she do? She wrote that letter on behalf of Radharani. And anyhow, she sent that letter to Krishna and Mathura. So this way, Mahaprabhu was always absorbed in Radha Bhava. So how could he write anything? So therefore, Mahaprabhu, he desired that this Unnatur Chalaras, this Swapakti Shriyam, the beauty of Srimati Radhika's Unnatur Chalaras, be distributed to everyone. So then, Rupa Goswami, by writing these books, Ujjavali Mani, Bhaktira Samrat Sindhu, he fulfilled this desire of Mahaprabhu. Now, if you see, any institution in this line of Mahaprabhu, any temple in this line of Mahaprabhu, any devotee who appears in this line of Mahaprabhu, he knows what the goal of life is. And what is the goal of life? To follow in the footsteps of the gopis. And who has shown the way to this goal of life? Rupa Goswami. The person from that who have known what the goal of life is. So therefore he is called Sri Chaitanya Mani Mano Krishna Paripurak. He who fulfilled the innermost heart's desire of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So similarly here also you see, Guru Devi fulfilled the innermost heart's desire of Srila Prabhupada by writing this commentary on the 10th canto of the Bhagavatam. So here Prabhupada is saying, it must not merely be the excess verbosity of scholars who are expert in utterance, nor an exhibition of Prakrit Sahajiyas. So here Prabhupada is saying when someone writes a commentary in the Bhagavatam, it should not be written with that word that I am very scholarly. No. Sometimes scholars, they translate books. But if you read those books, you see there is no bhav there. It's only like an exhibition of like scholarship. They use very fancy words. And they use that word, this word. There is so much word jugglery. No. How can you possibly grasp the essence when there is only an exhibition of scholarship? Therefore, there is this bhav anuvad. Bhav anuvad means what? means the translation is done and it's suffused with the moods of a pure devotee. This is called Bhavanuvad. No, when Gurudev would write any commentary in any book, he would say this is my Bhavanuvad. Not just an Anuvad, not just an ordinary translation. Bhavanuvad. <coughs> this, such kinds of translations are infused with these moods. Like when Shri Swami Maharaj was leaving this world, Shri Prabhupada, then his one disciple, he went and asked him, saying, Oh Prabhupada, we haven't finished the 11th and 12th canto of the Bhagavatam. We only finished only the 10th canto, the 14th chapter. So how will we finish the 11th and 12th canto? Who will help us? Because just translating on our own, how can we finish the Bhagavatam? And Swami Maharaj said, you go to Shri Sridhar Maharaj. He'll help you, he said. So this was Swami Maharaj's desire, that the entire Bhagavatam be completed under his guidance, under his care. Because only the Bhakta Bhagavat, he can explain what is in the Granta Bhagavat. No. So here therefore Prabhupada is saying that if even if one is a great scholar, he cannot, he cannot translate the Bhagavatam on his own. Nor should it be an exhibition of Prakrit Sahajiyas. Like we heard the other day, nowadays in this world, people in society, they are always like criticizing the gopis. But who are these gopis? They are married to other men and they are dancing with Krishna, who is like an ordinary lover. How can this be accepted? If God himself is seen dancing with the wives of others, then what will society think? There will be debauchery everywhere. Everyone will also be freely mixing with women, singing and dancing with them. Therefore, Prabhupada is saying that even when you are writing commentaries on such books, you must be very careful to not use words that are like very uh, low class. No. Like sometimes when you are describing the loving exchanges between Krishna and the gopis, sometimes you use certain words which are not very appropriate, very inappropriate. And how can you blame them also? No? Like if you see in Sanskrit, to explain the loving exchanges between Krishna and the gopis, they use this word Kaam Vilas. So if you see this word Kaam Vilas, it's so deep, it's so grave. And when you roughly translate it to English, then what does it mean? Oh, it means erotic love games. So you see the difference. There's Kaam Vilas and there's erotic love games. So you see there's such a vast gulf of difference. But still you cannot blame them also. Because you cannot find the appropriate words to describe these terms. Like if you see there's one more term in Sanskrit which is used to describe the gopis called Nitambini. Nitambini is roughly translated in English as in which form? Or curvaceous. Hmm? You're using all these terms. Voluptuous. No. That's that's 
the language. But still, if you really want to know the inner meanings of these words, then you have to do so much sadhana, so much bhajan. You have to be under the anukati of the Vaishnavas. Or else, when you come across certain terms like this, then you'll get a mundane understanding for the past times between gopis and Krishna. No. Like a curvaceous, voluptuous woman being with like an ordinary lover, engaging in erotic love games. No. Therefore, we must be very careful in reading such books. If you're not reading under proper guidance and proper anukata, you're bound to get a mundane understanding. Taking over, just as Krishna is enjoying with all the gopis and animals are enjoying with women, all Saham. Therefore, in that way, so many things happen in society. Therefore, Prabhupada here is saying that if anyone is going to write a commentary on the Bhagavatam, it should be written from the viewpoint, from the angle of pure devotion. So here he's saying, rather for those who earnestly thirst to serve transcendent beauty and in whom ardent spiritual greed for such service has arisen, this commentary will be considered most desirable to read. So Prabhupada is saying that those who have this greed in their hearts, to have these words of the gopis, those who have this lalsa, then such devotees, they'll find such commentaries written by pure devotees to be very relishable. Or else the others, they'll only be drawn by the external displays of such commentaries. So he's saying there is no book in existence that compares to the Bhagavatam. Its narrations are not mythology. One who makes a truly impartial study will realize that a sacred text like the Srimad Bhagavatam has never been excelled, nor can it ever be. So nowadays you see, especially in India, they say all these leaders of Krishna are mythology. They say the leaders of Krishna, the leaders of Ram, the leaders of Mahapur, they are all mythology. Mythology means something that has been cooked up. It means something that has been made up for the fantasies of others. They say these are all mythological tales. We taught that in school also, in Amazon school, I was told that it's just mythology, it never happened. It's just like an allegory. It's meant to mean something else. But Prabhupada here is saying, don't think of the Bhagavatam as like a mythological text. It is the absolute reality, he says. Within the Srimad Bhagavatam, progressively evolved conceptions of the absolute are demonstrated in sequence. The preliminary conception is doubtfulness. So here you see, whenever one thinks of God, he's always doubtful. He's always thinking, is there God? Even if there is God, how does he look like? And why is he so merciless? Why is he making us suffer so much in this medieval world? One is bound to have such doubts now. So therefore, Bhagavatam, what does it do? First it presents this stage of sunshine, this doubtfulness. And then comes denial of the personal absolute. And then gradually when this doubt has been taken away, then even then, one thinks that God is formless. Because if, if he thinks that God has a form, then he thinks that God is also limited to the trials and tribulations of this material world. And he also thinks that God, if we are suffering, then if God has a form, he is also suffering. He also has a body made of blood, flesh, bones. So then this comes, this denial of the personal form of Krishna. And then they accept him as impersonal and featureless, nirgun. Then they say that even if God exists, then he doesn't have any gender. They say, then how can he be male? How can he be female? How can God be confined to any gender? No. God is transcendent to any gender. He is neither male nor female. And then when one transcends that stage, then he comes to know that God is Purush. He is a personality. He is not someone impersonal. He is not someone without any qualities, without any form, without any activities. He is personal. He is personality. Therefore, Swami Maharaj, he always emphasized on this term, Supreme Personality of Godhead, he said. Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Because the places where he was, in all these different places where he was preaching, they were always denying the personality of Krishna. They are saying there is no such personality of Krishna, as Krishna. So Swami Maharaj said, who is Krishna? The Supreme Personality of Godhead. He established this understanding. And then Prabhupada is saying, then when one is established in that understanding that there is a personality, you must know that that personality also has a potency. No. There is Shakti and Shakti Man. Shakti means the potency. And Shakti Man means the possessor of the potency. So don't think that the potent, the potent that is Shakti Man is only by himself. He also has the Shakti by his side. And that is Yuval Bhajana. Means Radha and Krishna. Like you see in Vaikuntha, they are worshipped as Lakshmi Narayan. In Kailash, who are Shiva? Who is Shiva and who is Parvati? They are in one way manifestations of Radha and Krishna. And in Ayodhya, they are worshipped as Sita Radha. 
In Dwarka, they worship as Rukmini, Krishna as Atibaba. And here in Guru Prindavan, they worship as Radha and Krishna. So this is the most complete form of uh, God that we can think of. In this world, people are always asking, who is God? How does he look like? How should we worship him? How should we approach him? So you see, that form in which God presents himself in his yugal forms, as Radha Krishna yugal, that is the most complete form of God that you can possibly imagine. There is no, there is no concept of God that exceeds this conception. Therefore, the conception then next evolves to Sakya, which is the eternal matrimony of the Supreme Male and his consort. And finally, Parakya. So you see here, Prabhupada again saying that even amongst the, this conception, even, on, even we're thinking of this conception of Shaktiman and Shakti, the possessor of the potency and potency, even in this classification, there are two categories. What is that? Sakya and Parakya. Means in one form, the potent and the potency, they're married. And in another form, they're not married. The paramour conception. So in this way, the final theme, Krishna appears in the 10th canto. So in this way, the very essence of Krishna's pastimes mean what? Is Parakya Bhav. The Radha and Krishna are not really married to each other. Rather, they have this relationship that Radha Rani is married to someone else. And Krishna is her lover. So this is the ultimate conception of Godhead. This is the ultimate conception of God. And this is what Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to give. And this is what his followers have come to give. And this is not just some theoretical understanding of Godhood. What is the meaning of this understanding? That ultimately, if we also practice pure devotional service in our lives, if we also do proper sadhana, proper bhajan, then we can also take part in these leaders. Not just that we read them. No. Why do the devotees speak of these leaders? Why do they publish books on these leaders? Why? So that we can gain a proper understanding and we become steady in our devotional services and ultimately enter into these leelas. This is the goal of bhakti. Not just that we're reading them and speculating about them. No. That we have this greed. And then can I also be there? Serve Radha and Krishna. Assist them in their leelas. So this is the fullest conception of God. And this is the innermost heart's desire of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. This was his desire. And this conception of Godhood, of Radha and Krishna, being in Parakya Bhav, Parakya Ras, we distribute it to the entire world. And then our Guru Varga, following in the line of Srila Rupa Goswami, by publishing books, and fulfilling this desire of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Like you see, all these books that the Vaishnavas have published also, like Radha Ras Sudhanidhi, Prem Bhakti Chandrika, Krishna Karnamrit, Ras Panchadai, Vaishnava Gurudev, Ujjal Lirumani, Gita Govinda. Gita Govinda is such a rasik book. There's no, it's so like confidential the purpose of this book. And Gurudev also published that book. And there was so much opposition by the other devotees saying, why is he publishing this book, Gita Govinda? It's so confidential and such confidential expressions of Radha and Krishna's love. Why is he publishing it? Gurudev said, if I don't publish it, then it will be lost forever. If I don't publish it, then who will publish it? He said. All these books will be lost. No one, will be able, no one will be able to read them ever in their lives. Now you see, it is only by Gurudev's mercy that we can even think of such books. Like Bhutchal Nirmani, Ras Panchadai, Gita Govind. If it wasn't for Gurudev, could we ever imagine reading these books? Even thinking about them. But he has given these books for us. So in this way, this is the fullest expression of the Bhagavatam. Bhagavatam is complemented by these books. These books are like commentaries on the Bhagavatam. And our Guru and we have come to give these books. So therefore, we are very fortunate to be in the association of such most wonderful exalted associates of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And we can only pray at the feet of Mahaprabhu that life after life, we always stay in that association. We never be deprived of that association. And this way, gradually, step by step, we make our lives successful. For all will be here. And uh, when they speak Katha, we must make sure that we properly listen to them. Not just listen, but also invite these instructions and practice them in our lives as much as we can. And Chak is not the